Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome. Today we're gonna do a tutorial slash rules overview slash playthrough session with Captain C, the 2021 war game from Legion War Games concentrating on combat in the Age of Sail, specifically combat involving the American frigates from 1799 to 1815. Now this is gonna be more of a rules overview and kind of a tutorial than it is going to be a playthrough session. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of the engagements in the game, we're going to play basically the Endymion versus the President, which is a battle that happened in January of 1815. And we're going to set it up, talk about the key mechanics, and then play through the whole first turn, explaining the rules as we go along. So if you're trying to learn the game, I'm hopeful this video will be helpful. If you're thinking about getting the game, it might give you some greater insights to how the game is actually played. And then if you want to see a playthrough, it could still be entertaining, admittedly at kind of a slower pace than one would normally get with just a straight playthrough video. Now. Three things about this video that I think are important to understand before we start. Um, first up, I think I have a fairly good understanding on how to play, but I'm also fairly confident that I might be making a couple of mistakes in a couple of places. Maybe I've interpreted some rule a little bit incorrectly, or maybe I'm assuming something that isn't quite right within the given rule set. For those cases, I'm going to put a known errors section in the video description. So after you watch this, if you're confused by anything, take a look at that section and I'll add in information and clarifications or any corrections that need to be made to this video after its publication. Secondly, if you're learning the game from the box rules, I would highly encourage you to visit Board Game Geek to look at the section, the page for Captain C, and then look specifically for the forum for this game, and then the rules folder, rule, the rules threads within that forum. I'll put a link to it in the video description as well. The designer's been very active since the game's been published, clarifying different rules and kind of tweaking little things that have uh, come out since the game's been published. So that definitely is a good place to start for learning how to uh, kind of play the game the way it's intended to be played. And lastly, the third thing is there's a few places, very small and subtle places, where I'm exper experimenting a little bit with some house rules. And when I get to those places, if that comes up, I will mention what the official rule is and why I might be kind of modifying or what I might be experimenting with a little bit with a modification for it. They're really subtle, they're not big, and I'll be really clear about it. So it shouldn't impact your learning at all. With all that being said, let's jump in now and let's get started. All right, so here we are taking a look at the part of the game map. And the game map is basically just these blue squares that simulate the ocean, a big chunk of this. And we can see the starting position of our two ships here. We've got the President right here, and then the Endymion right here. And let's do a little bit of historical backdrop to set kind of the stage for this. So this battle happened in the middle of January 1918, uh, sorry, uh, 1815. And the, back, the story behind it was it was in the middle of the War of 1812, and the Treaty of Ghent had actually already been signed. So officially, the war was over, but it took a long time for news to spread in those days. So the combatants in New England and the United States didn't know that the war was over. So they were still battling each other. Now, the president and most of the U.S. frigates had been bottled up by blockades around the harbors they had been in during the war. And the president was in New York. The ship was in New York trying to get out for the longest time. Finally, on the evening of the 14th, in the midst of a wintry snowstorm and frozen gale with strong winds the, and dark, the president tried to run the blockade, figuring that the British ships had to move out to sea because the winds were so strong. This would be a chance to get past the blockade. So as it left at night in the snowstorm and the winds and stuff like that, trying to navigate some of the dangerous waters around New York, it ran into some shoals and it ran aground. It spent about two hours trying to get itself off the shores at shoals. At one point, the crew were running from the port starboard side to the port side back and forth to try to wiggle the ship off the shoals. It took about two hours to get them off, during which time it had demasted a couple times and it had ripped up kind of the bottom of the hull as well, too. So the president had lost a lot of speed. Now, if it had gone, it could have gone back to New York, it would have, but the winds were too strong, so it had to try to continue on its journey. And sure enough, the next day, it ran into the four freight British ships that were providing the blockade of the harbor to its dead east. 
So it tried to escape from the four ships. However, because of the damage it had suffered by trying to go over the shoal, it wasn't faster than all four. And the Endymion, the British, the fastest of the four British ships, the British frigate, was gaining ground on the president. So the president's trying to run. It's throwing stuff off. It's, it's cut its anchors. It's threw its fresh water off, throwing anything it can to make the ship lighter to try to get away from the Endymion into the water. But it's just losing ground. So finally, it decided it has to engage. And the initial plan was to turn and to try to board the Endymion, capture the Endymion because they got a larger crew, and then take the Endymion back to New York. But the, the captain of the Endymion was able to keep away, and the ships traded broadsides for a while, during which both sides suffered some damage. Then finally, the, the U.S. president got in some good shots on the Endymion to slow it down enough, to damage the ringing enough, they loaded with chain shot, to damage the rigging enough that it said, okay, now we can try to escape. But as it did that, the Endymion got two good rakes in on the president, basically slowing, slowing the ship down a lot. It allowed the other British ships that were chasing to catch up. And after a brief engagement, Stephen Decatur, the captain of the president, surrendered and struck his colors to surrender to the British forces. Um, the U.S. forces had been up for about 30 hours in a freezing winter storm as well, too, which was a factor as to kind of what had gone on with that battle. So... In the real battle, the president was uh, struck its colors, but it only fought, it fought more than, it engaged with more than one ship. In the game here, we're just seeing this one versus one engagement, the Endymion versus the president, which ship will strike its colors first. So a couple things about the mat here as we're looking at this, and I'll put up the piece. You can see that each ship basically has eight letters around it. Now H here is the front of the ship, and C, uh, or the bow of the ship, and C is the stern of the ship. And so right now we can see that both the president is heading to the, we'll call this east, I guess, here as an H, and so is the Endymion with its H, its, its, pro, its um, bow pointing to the east. So the Endymion is chasing the president. And also here on the right-hand side, you can see that we've got this wind gauge, which is an eight-point wind gauge. And I'm just going to slide this a little bit that way so we can see it. So we see one here is to the north, three is to the east. And we can see that the wind is blowing at an angle of four. And this is how you determine which angle the wind is to the ship. So the wind is blowing this way. It's coming in from this side of the president. So this president is currently sailing at a B angle. And in this case, this is going to be called a broad reach, where the wind is coming from the rear, but not directly from the rear. It's the optimal sailing angle for the fastest speed. So this is at a broad reaching, and it's an, a B angle for this for the ship here. So both of these are at this B angle. And this is important. This angle of the wind to the ship is really important for how you determine move, maneuvering and how you determine movement rates. So with that being said, let's jump in now and take a quick look at the ship mats, which are going to show a little bit of the information and the details about the status of each one of these ships. All right, so let's walk through the ship mats to take a look at um, what the characteristics of each of these two combatants are. Now, each ship in the game, and there's 16 of them, has its own individual mat and has unique characteristics based on that ship. And so let's walk through the president here, which we've got on the right. And of course, the Endymion is on the left. We can see the British flag, American flag, US flag here. And then we can see the crew statuses with various points on them. Now, we've set this all up ready to go for the start of the game. and. Well, let's walk through the president, though, and just kind of talk through some of the characteristics of it. So on the left-hand side, this vertical strip right here, this is the crew, the amount of crew that the ship has. And we can see that the, Endym uh, the, the president has 20 points worth of crew, so a very large crew. And you'll notice on the right side of this crew marker, there are a minus 0, minus 1, and a minus 2 in red. If the crew falls to these levels, you immediately do a morale check with this dice roll modifier on the, on the ship as well. So as the crew suffers casualties, there's a potential for their morale to, to fall just because of the fact that they're losing casualties. If it gets all the way down to the bottom here, we can see this strike check at the very bottom. That means you have to perform a roll at the end of the turn to see if the ship strikes its colors, which, you know, if you, if you lose all your crew, you're in pretty rough shape anyway. So there's a lot more to talk about, though, as we go through here. The next one in this top right here is the crew quality. It can be three types. Crack, which is, of course, is the best. Average or green, which is a minus one modifier. Not very good. Now, 
I'm going to kind of hop over this other column here because I think it'll make more sense if we talk about this large right section of the ship first. This basically you can see an impression of the ship very lightly under, underneath this. So this is kind of a visual representation of what kind of shape the ship is in at this point in time. You'll notice that there are basically three vertical columns here. The left side is basically the port hull status. The right side is the starboard hull status. And then the middle line down here is the rigging status. Now there's a few other pieces that we'll talk about, but that's the general principle that we're working with. You'll notice also that this hull status is carved into two points. There's a breach right here. So these first bank here is the port forward. So basically the front left of the ship. This is the port aft, which is the back left, of course, uh, starboard forward and starboard aft and so aft and so on. And these points that you see with an eight as a maximum and this point marker on the top represents how much strength and stability, how many points are left basically in this section of the ship. So as the hull on this side get hit, on this side gets hit, we're going to be reducing these points down to the point where can get zero and things like that. And so this is basically the four sections. We can see that the president has eight points worth of kind of stability. It's a pretty big, strong ship here. Now, one other thing to notice that might be a little bit tricky to see on the video, but you can see down the left-hand side, there are some numbers. So for example, beside the top here, we have a 6-3 the very bottom here we have a 1-1. One, one. The first number is the number of long cannons that the ship has within this section of its hull and then the second number is the number of carronades it has. Now the long guns, the regular cannons, can fire 24 movement points worth of range and these carronades can fire six uh, so these are more short. The second number is used more at short range. And it can also, if they're firing with a range of three or less, which is basically adjacent to each other, then you double that number, which is extremely deadly. So most of the time you're going to be firing with six here. And if it's a full broadside that you're firing, which most often you're going to be, it's going to be six plus six, which is 12 points worth of cannons being fired from the president until things get into close range. So you can see a similar side here on the right hand side and then this section here is what type of shot is loaded in it so the game starts with the shot loaded we are going to load round shot into all of the sections on all of the ships right now but you could have round shot up here you could have double shot which is a little bit more effective at pounding the hull you could have chain which is good at getting at the rigging we're all doing all four loaded with uh, round shot for all four ships and I'll talk a little bit about kind of why we're doing that later then so that takes care of the outside points in here then down the middle we can see that we have rigging points. Now the president usually starts with 14 rigging points, but to simulate the damage that it did to itself on the shoal and in the storm, in the game the president starts with its rigging points at 7. So it's already at a reduced sailing capacity and we'll talk about that in a moment. Now when these rigging points get all the way down to this box down here, it's a strike check. You have to perform a strike check on the ship as well. So uh, that gets rid of the, that talks about the main sections here. Let's talk about a couple of other things. Up at the front and the back, we have the forward chasers and then the stern chasers. These are cannons, uh, light cannons that you can damage, aim to uh, damage the rigging that are fired if you can't get in broadsides from either side. So you have to be within that kind of range to it then to get a broadside. Then lastly, you'll notice the last thing to talk about in this middle section right here are these damage control points. We can assign crew to these boxes, to these damage control points, and they can potentially repair sections of the hull as the battle is going on. That can be pretty important because if you notice, you know, say for example, the president were to lose three points on this hull left, the, the port forward broadside, instead of having six cannons available, it's only going to have four and carronades go down from three to two. So as you lose hull capacity, you lose firepower as well. So sometimes you want to try to get crew into these damage control sections, and we'll talk about how that all works later, but you're going to be assigning crew here to try to repair the hull as you're kind of fighting along. So that's everything there. Now let's talk a little bit about this middle section down here. We've talked about crew quality. In here we've got the sail state. The sail state can be one of two things. It can be either medium sail, which is basically full speed, but if you get hit in the rigging, you suffer full damage, or you can be at fighting sail. Now fighting sail modifies your movement points by a divisor of two, but it allows that if you get hit in the rigging, it only does half as much damage. So you're making a decision in the game whether you want maneuverability with the potential to suffer more rigging damage or whether you want to not get be able to get damage with rigging, 
but you're going to be losing some maneuverability. Now, the president is stuck here. Unless we can fix the rigging, it's stuck at seven rigging points, so it can only be in fighting sail capacity, so it's going to start the game at that capacity. Now, if the president were at had the potential to shift to medium sail, we could assign some crew members to this box, which would be a rigging change box, and we'll talk about how that works later too. But right now, we're, we haven't assigned crew points yet. We're just kind of starting the game, so we'll talk about how that works in a second. But for right now, we're just this is empty. This is there. Then we can also assign a crew member to what is called sailing, and this is going to help us do what are called strains at the end of turns. We'll talk more about those. This is generally, I think, a pretty good place to put a crew remember because strainings are basically a risky move that's going to allow you to move one more square at the risk of if you fail you're going to get some more damage to your rigging and adding a crew member to work to kind of dedicate to that sailing work is going to increase the likelihood by one point that we're not going to fail and get a ring rigging damage instead of being able to make that kind of extra straining move at the end of a turn then the last two to talk about are damage control here. This is damage control for the rigging. So if we put crew members in here, we have a potential to be able to fix the rigging. And that's something we're probably going to start out with with the president because we have a little bit of extra crew capacity. So we're probably going to assign some crew members to try to repair the rigging because that potentially could get us up into the medium sail and we could then shift to that and be a little bit more maneuverable. Then the last thing here we have is crew morale. It is at four levels, handy, fair, unfit, and then this thing that's unnamed, which is like basically just like everybody's ready to give up. And that's where we have another strike check, which is a potential. If the crew morale falls to this horrible level, there's a chance that the ship will strike its colors and the game will be over. So that's an example, a walkthrough of kind of how the ship mat works. Let's just take a look now and compare these two ships because there's a couple of things that we haven't mentioned yet that are going to come to bear. First of all, we can see that they're fairly similar, but the president has a bigger crew, 20 points worth of crew to Endymion's 15. So the president has a larger crew, which is helpful. Also, the president has slightly better hull capacity and cannon firepower, right? Six points of firepower here. The Endymion at full capacity is at five. So the president's got a little bit more firepower, and it's got a little bit stronger and hardier hull here because it's got eight points compared to the Endymion's six points. Crew quality is exactly alike. They're cracked, and both crews start with morale at handy. Everything is loaded. Everything else is working. The big difference here, then, that's trying to offset a little bit, if you would, the capacity of the hull and the capacity of the larger crew for the president is the fact that the rigging points are already at 50%. So this would potentially be a chance for the Endymion to try to drive this rigging down to basically demask the president and force it to strike its colors if it can get down into this box. So that would be a strategy for the Endymion, and we'll talk about that as we start to get into maneuvering. The last thing to mention is up here on the top. We have uh, two things, for the, at least for our battle, that we have to make note of. One is the hull type. And this might be a little bit tricky to see, but we have hull type, which is fast for the president and fast for Endymion. That's important when we're determining movement rates in the turn, so we'll see how that works. Then we have hull strength. The president's hull is firm, so it's going to get a plus one to some modifiers and some roll. It's going to get some die roll modifiers. As we'll talk a little bit how that works, but the hull strength base is going to help the president to repel a little bit of damage. The Endymion's hull strength is only average, which isn't quite as good as the president. So there we have kind of an overall kind of description of how the ship mats work, work and then how the differences are, what the differences are between the Endymion and the President as we start the battle. So with that being said, it's pretty much time to distribute our cards for the game and get started. So let's do that. The game uses a deck of cards, and a lot of these cards are pretty neat and provide a lot of variety for the encounters. Each uh, side, st each ship, starts with three cards at the start of the game. So I'm going to draw three cards for the president to the right side of the pile, and then three cards for the Endymion on the left side of the pile. Now, there are two types of cards. There are hold cards, and then there are some play now cards, which you have to play immediately. If we draw a play now card at the, at the very beginning of the game, we put it in the discard pile, and we just don't play it, and we leave it there until the hand gets, the deck gets reshuffled. So let's pick the president's first card and take a look at it right now. Now, some of these I don't know. Some of them, of course, with card-given games are better than others. So our first card here is the Best Laid Plans, which is a hold card. It says, immediately cancel the effects of a card just played by your opponent. Okay, so that might be interesting. Let's pick the first card for the Endymion. The Endymion says, fire as she bears, which is increase the number of combat dice 
for any one section by half. This is a card I've had before. This is a really good card. The reason is that you can basically, so if the Endymion were to fire five, it would be firing five. And I think you generally in this game, you round the rule say to round up. So it'd be firing eight from one section. So that's a pretty good one to play straight up. Now, one of the ways you can also play these cards, which I'll talk about as we get into the game a little bit more, is that instead of playing it for its stated purpose, you can always play a card down here below. It says you can discard it to add plus one to any single die roll. And especially for morale checks, I've found that I think these can be really helpful. But we'll talk more about that as we get into the game. Let's pick the president's second card. Salt and salt water. Roll a die and immediately extinguish a shipboard fire. If the, sh if the roll is a one or a two, sustain an additional rigging hit. So that's okay. I'm not, I mean, you, we, can, we should be able to put out fires pretty well. So I think that might be one we would be saving to use for morale check if the president were to need it. Drop the sea anchor. Allow your ship to back sails twice in the same square. That could be interesting. And we'll, back sails may, means basically stop the ship dead in the water. And when you do that in the game, you can only do that once. If you, if you pick a back sails maneuver like that, the next maneuver can't be back sails again. But this card would allow you, allow you to do that. So that's kind of a cool card. I haven't used that one. We, I'm not sure that one will come in handy for what the Endymion is going to try to do. But you never know. Uh, don't give up the ship. Add two to each strike roll. So that could be very handy if we get later in the engagement and we are going to strike, then uh, strike our colors. So that might, might allow us to continue fighting a little bit. We'll probably use that for something else because hopefully it's not going to get that bleak that early in the game. Okay. Lastly, we're here for the Endymion, Slippery with Blood. So all these six cards, by the way, have been hold cards. Slippery with Blood. Increase the load period for any two sections by two impulses. Okay, so this is a card I think we could play on our opponent's card to make them slower to reload, which, oh, increase, sorry, this, I'm a little bit confused on this one. Increase, does that mean make it faster or slower? It looks like it would be slippery, that it's gonna be inefficient. We would be able to play it on our opponent's cards to make them go too longer. That's the way I'm going to kind of interpret that one. But let me know if you think that one might be a little bit different. So there we have our uh, three cards for each side. And with that, basically the starting conditions are set. We've kind of established the, pre the mat for the president and the endymion. We've drawn our initial cards and I'll put these below the ships and we'll kind of talk about these and bring them into play as we need to. And uh, it's time for us basically now to, uh, to start the engagement. Alrighty, so before we start the game, I just want to kind of talk a little bit about what my strategy thinking is going to be for this game, uh, for the battle. Now, I've played this engagement before, and one of the things that's kind of important for a, a sailing game like this is that you want to be basically holding the wind gauge, which means that you want to try to be in a superior wind position to your opponent. And we can see that even the wind's coming this way. The Endemon has a slight advantage in the wind gauge right now because it's got a little bit more of the wind than the the president does in terms of the president is downwind from the Endymion a little bit. Now, when I played this uh, encounter before, I had both ships immediately maneuver to starboard, uh, to the port, sorry, to the left it would be, to move to port, and that allowed them to fire broadsides at each other. My thinking was that neither ship would want to give up the wind advantage, so they're going to kind of turn up into the wind rather than turn to the starboard side, which would put them potentially downwind of their opponents relatively quickly. But when I fought this before, that didn't work very well for the Endymion because in a straight out slugfest, the president is probably going to win. It's got a little bit superior in a crew capacity. It's got a firmer hull and it's got more firepower. And that's kind of what happens. Slowly, bit by bit, the, the, the president wore down the Endymion. Then finally, it got off a couple of really good shots. Their crew morale fell. And once your crew morale falls, you're kind of toast. And the Endymion basically kind of fell apart after that, and it ended up a demasted, you know, shattered, burning hulk by the end of the battle. So we're going to try something different from the Endymion's perspective, and this will also help to kind of see how this plays out. And it's one thing that I want to test because I want to test to see if the Endymion could perhaps get advantage of the president by using its superior maneuverability and trying to give up the wind gauge to try to get some, maybe a couple of broadsides off that the president won't be able to answer. So. We're going to have the president do like I did the first time, which is basically it's going to try to turn to kind of turn to the port to try to hold on to as much of the wind gauge as it can and try to fire into the Endymion's, uh, you know, starboard side or fire into the Endymion over here. The Endymion, however, is going to be a little bit craftier. This time we're going to have the Endymion 
turn to the starboard and basically try to cut in behind the president to see if he can get a couple of shots off from in this base while the president is turned away because the president with its weakened maneuverability might not be able to maneuver turn back and if the endymion could get perhaps even a rake in or one or two broadsides that are unanswered that might help it tip the table the tip the sides in terms of the endymion's favor now i haven't had a lot of luck yet at shooting out the rigging on opponent ships and i've talked a little bit about that in the renew in the review so we're going to have bolt ships we have bolt ships loaded with round shot and they're going to aim for the hull. So they're basically going to try to pound the other ship into a little bit of submission here because I think that's going to work better even though the president is already at kind of uh, a, a lower rigging status. So with that being said, we kind of know their initial strategy and we'll talk a little bit about some more other subtleties here too. Let's jump back over to the ship mats and do the very first thing that we have to do which is to assign crew to different parts of the ship for our first turn. Let's start out by assigning crew for the president ship first. Now, in general, this would be done in secret from your opponent. And one of the things, interestingly enough, that I was asking the designer about was, you know, if you're playing this two-player, you can see the other person's shipment. You can kind of see where they've assigned points. And that's actually going to kind of tell you which way they might turn and things like that. And then the designer was saying, yeah, that might be a good way to start, but eventually you'd probably want to keep this information hidden from your opponent with just sharing kind of damage states and stuff like that. So that would be kind of obvious that you would be able to see as an opponent in terms of how badly the ship is doing. So, uh, but we're just going to, of course, have everything out in the open because we're doing this uh, single player. So the president, as we mentioned, is going to be turning to the port because it's going to try to fire its port broadsides into the Endymion as it approaches. So we have uh, 20 points worth of crew. We're going to put eight points up here. So we can see seven. This is eight. We're going to put eight on the port forward broadside. We're going to put eight points on the aft uh, port broadside. So that's 16 of our points right there. We have four points left to assign. We're going to assign one point to sailing because we're probably going to have to strain at the end and we don't want to do any more damage to our rigging. Two points left to deal with stuff. We're going to put two points on damage control for our rigging because hopefully we'll be able to, at the end of the turn, perhaps be able to repair some rigging and be able to go to medium sail if we would like to. Lastly, we have one extra point. We're not going to work on rigging change. We don't need that yet. But with that one extra point, I'm just going to put a point in damage control here on the port broadside, the port forward broadside, because if we do some hull damage at the end of the turn, we might be able to have one of those crew members repair it. And I really can't see any other place that it would make sense to assign that extra point of crew. So we have eight and eight is 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 points of crew. Our basic strategy is using the crew to fire the, the port broadsides, work on sailing and try to fix some of the rigging that's been tattered by this storm, as well as having a little bit of the crew stand by for uh, damage control on the port forward broadside. Now, any crew that isn't assigned in the game gets assigned to melee. We're too far apart to have to worry about melee right now, so we don't have anybody. We're not leaving anybody left over. But you, you, the, the, the way you assign crew for melee is you leave them out. You leave them unassigned. We don't have to worry about that right now. If we did, we would leave more unassigned to that. Okay, so now if we go over to Endymion here, we've got to do the same thing for the Endymion. Now, the Endymion only has 15 crew. Uh, which is a little bit uh, less, of course, than the, significantly less, about 25% less than the president. We, however, are now, we're talked about for the Endymion, we're going to have the Endymion turn to starboard and try to get off a port broadside as well down along the president, then cut in behind it. So we are going to man the port cannons on the Endymion too, which is six, and six is 12 points. So we have three extra points. Now we have no damage yet. We're going to put one point on sailing. So that leaves us two extra points. Now we might want to change sail state, but I don't think so. I think we want to keep the maneuverability. We probably could take some hits here. So we are going to assign with our extra two points, we're going to assign one point to damage control on the port side and one point on damage control to the port aft, sorry, port forward and port aft. Just in case they get shot at and get some damage, we might be able to fix those at the end of the turn. So that gives us with Endymion, it gives us six and six is 12, 13, 14, 
15 points of a crew assigned. So that's the very first thing that you do at the beginning of every turn. You think about where you want to put your crew, how you're going to use them, and where you're going to assign points. And so we've done that now for the Endymion and the President. So now we're going to go to the next stage and the next phase of the game in sequence of play, which is determining the initiative to see which ship of the two have initiative. So let's go do that. Determining initiative is a very simple process, and I'm going to call you, we're just using the status track in here, and we'll show how this works as we go through there. We have a British initiative marker, and we have a U.S. British, a U.S. initiative marker, and all we do is, to, it's, a, it's basically a die roll to see which of the two sides get a higher die roll. Now, there are some modifies for, modifiers for it. The first is the crew quality makes a modifier, in this case, plus one for a crack crew. However, both the President and the Endymion have crack crews, and they're always going to be that way. So we're not even going to apply that modifier because it's basically a wash. But you just want to know it. If there were a difference in crew quality, you'd want to make that adjustment for the die rolls here. So we can just leave those the way they are. The other two possible die roll modifiers for this are you subtract one for each consecutive turn your opponent, um, each consecutive turn you have held the initiative. So. If the uh, Endymion were to get the initiative right now, we're going to put the initiative marker on number one. Then in the second turn, the Endymion would have a minus one marker because it's held the initiative for one turn. Say the Endymion were to get really lucky and hold it for three turns, on that next subsequent initiative roll would be subtracting three for the die roll. So as you get further into the initiative sequence, it's harder to maintain the initiative. The last possible die roll modifier, which you may be able to anticipate already, is if we did want to play one of our cards, we could play a card to get a plus one modifier because you can always play a card to modify any dice roll in the game by plus one. You can never use them for negative die roll modifiers, but you can always use it for a plus modifier. We're not going to do that in any case right now. So because the crew, crew quality uh, die roll modifiers wash out, we're just going to roll. And we have uh, both blue, white, blue dice and white dice. When we're rolling head to head like this, we're going to roll two dice at the same time. The blue die is going to represent the president and the white die will represent the endymion. Let's see which side gets the initiative. So we have a four and a three. So as a four and a three means the president is going to get the initiative. So we'll put the initiative marker in the one box. And we're going to flip this over. You'll notice the other side of this has hits on it. So that means we're going to use the unused initiative marker for this time to be able to track hits if there's any hits that get fired by the ship. And we'll see that more as we get into that now. So the U.S. Uh, president has the initiative and let us continue on. So let's talk a little bit about movement because it's got a very kind of a unique system in the game. And so the first thing is to, to understand about movement rates is that they're relative. And that means that if two ships are going in this with the same wind bearing, uh, in the same, basically going in the same direction, their movement rates are going to be zero because relative to each other, they're not gaining any speed or losing any speed. Now there's two things we're gonna to do to check that, and we'll talk about well, two things we're gonna to do to determine the movement rates and how that all works. So let's get started on that. Keep that concept in mind that the movement rates are relative for one ship towards the other. So basically right now what we've got is we've got both the President and the Endymion at the same wind bearing, because they're pointed in the same exact direction. So if we look on our base movement table, we can see that the initiative ship has a bearing of B, and the non-initiative ship has a bearing of B. We're gonna cross-reference these and we get zero, zero, which is exactly what we said. They're both going in the same direction with the same wind bearing, so it's zero, zero. So the base movement points right now for each ship is a zero. However, once we've done that, we then go to the hull type bonus table, which basically is, I'll show this table here right now. Um, you go, you're gonna cross-reference the hull type with a die roll and to get some additional bonus movement points. So this is basically accommodating for things like crew quality and the basic speed of the hull. So this is where actually we're gonna get some movement in this first turn, because for the moment, both ships are going in the same direction at the same speed. We're gonna change that by the way the ships maneuver, just so we can also see. One of the things I wanna do with this, with this battle is to, to show how some of the different things work. So we're gonna make our first move to make sure that we see how different this can get in the second move. So for right now, if we look at the hull, hull bonus table, um, we can see that we differ, We both hull types are fast, so the President is fast and the Endymion is fast. And we're going to roll a die, and the die roll modifier, again, now on this one here, if you have the game, it's going to say crew status, 
And that's kind of an error. There's a number of places in the rules and the player's aids and stuff like that where it says crew status instead of either crew quality or crew morale. And there is no crew status in the game. Now the designers come out and said, wherever you see status, it is crew morale. However, it's clear if you look in the rules for this one that it talks about crack and green for, for modifying this. So I'm using that reference in the rules and assuming that in this case, it's supposed to be quality. And so we're gonna run with that because that matches with the rules uh, in the book as well. So that might be a little bit different than you see has been the broad standard. So there's one place where I'm kind of doing something perhaps a little bit different. I just feel like the way the rules are written it's talking about quality, so we're gonna use quality. So uh, we're gonna roll uh, both dice. We're gonna roll the US die and the British die, and then we're gonna determine their relative movement speeds. So the US rolled a two, uh, the President rolled a two, and the Endymion rolled a one. Now, because of their crew quality is both crack, they are going to increase this by plus one. So if we look at for the US, which has a hull type of fast, and it has a plus, it has a normally rolled a two, but it's up to a three, it's going to get plus two. So we're gonna get two movement points and we wanna kind of keep that in mind. The Endymion, which has a fast hull, rolled a one, but it too has a plus one for crack, so it gets plus two. So both the Endymion and the President, those advantages are gonna cancel each other out and they're gonna have two movement points to work with in this current turn coming up. We're gonna see how that works. You'll notice that you can never end up with less than zero. So even if both ships are going in the same way, there's always going to be at least one movement point because that's the slowest you can get. So that ensures that at least something's going to happen in the turn. So now we know that both ships have uh, two movement points to work with. Let's go on and uh, kind of set up our activation cycle for these movement rates. Give yourself a bonus point if you figured out the one mistake I almost made. That, of course, is that what we've mentioned at the very beginning, the president has had extensive rigging damage already, so it is at fighting sails, which means that after we make all the calculations for the, the movement rates for the different per the turn, we have to take the president's movement rate and divide it by two. So both the president and the endymion have two movement points currently. We're going to divide the president by two and round up if there's any fraction. So the president, instead of having two movement points or activation points, is only going to have one. Now let's jump in and set up the turn. Okay, so now that we've calculated the movement points for each ship, two points for the endymion and one point for the president, it's time for us to explore the turn tracker. Now, in Captain C, every turn is carved up into 12 impulses. We can see impulse 1 here on the left and impulse 12 all the way on the right. And there's two levels to this. We're going to put what are called activation markers on this top row. And then anytime a ship is going to reload ammunition, we'll see that it's going to get dropped on the turn tracker in one of the places for reloading ammunition. But right now, all we have to deal with are the activation markers, the movement points, really, that we've calculated for each ship. Now these movement points, the two for Endymion and the one for President, get um, transferred into what are called activations. And we're gonna basically drop them on the turn tracker. Then we're gonna work from left to right across the turn tracker. And whenever a ship gets into an activation, that means it potentially can make a maneuver. So, and we'll see how that works shortly. But let's get this set up first. So the Endymion has two activations. So two movement points and two activations. So we're looking left, we can work all the way across and basically we're looking for any impulse that has the number two on it, which is number six. And then if we come all the way over here, number 12 also has the number two on it. It makes sense, like halfway across, right? So there's two, so each one's gonna be at six and 12. The poor president, however, with its tattered rigging, only had, she got one movement point this turn. So we come all the way across and it goes right here on the end where we see the number one. Basically, if you only have one activation, it's gonna be the last activation in that, last impulse, if you would, in that particular turn. Now, sometimes we're gonna see in the next turn when the movement rates are, there's a greater difference. You know, sometimes a ship can get like eight activations in here and the other ship's only gonna get three. So it can vary a lot and those can be much busier turns. But right now we have two for the Endymion and one for the President, largely because they're both going in the same direction with the wind. So uh, now this of course took us a while to calculate all this, but when you're playing and not explaining the rules, this actually goes pretty fast. You really be able to calculate the base movement points, the hull bonus, and then any, any changes due to rigging or to being demastered or something like that, and then dropping these down pretty fast. So although it's taking us a while to walk through it, uh, in actual gameplay, this goes pretty smoothly. So now that we've got everything set up to begin the turn, it is time to get started with our first turn. 
Alrighty, so now that we've got the activations set up for the first turn, we're ready to kind of finally start the activation cycle and get into the meat of the first turn. So let's just talk a little bit about what we're gonna do because we're gonna make some maneuvers and we'll talk a little bit about how those happen. So the, the US ship, and it's important to note, it's facing a side. So if it were to advance and try to go forward in the ship, it's gonna to have to advance across a side. It cannot advance across a corner because advance in this game means straight ahead. So to advance across a corner, you would have to try to be pointed this way. It's only going to be advanced, able to advance across a side in this instance. Okay, so that's one thing. Now you also notice that we've got the wind pointed at the B. So that's where we're gonna be able to select our maneuvers from. With we are broad reaching, we're only going to be able to select the maneuvers on the maneuver chart that have the ship's bearing currently at a B, and we'll see how that works at a second. But just to kind of talk a little bit about our strategy, we know that we want the US ship, the president, to wear to a bearing of E, which is a beam reaching. So the wind coming directly from the side into the ship because we wanna fire the port broadside directly at the endymion as it's approaching here. So we want to make a maneuver with the president that's gonna wear the ship or turn the ship to the port so it's gonna be getting the wind from E. So we're, that's the goal for the president. The endymion, again, we mentioned is gonna be trickier. It's gonna give up a little bit of the wind gauge because it's gonna turn to port. So for the endymion, we're gonna make a maneuver that's gonna try to turn it to a wind bearing of C. So we can see the C here at the back of the endymion and the wind is coming from that way. So we wanna turn endymion to basically wear it so that it's gonna be a C bearing. And we want to turn the president so it's gonna be a bearing of E. Let's go over to the maneuvers panel, the control panel, and take a look at how this works within the game. Alrighty, so now that we've calculated our activations per turn and we know what things we're trying to do with our ships, it's time for us to come in and to use the control panel to select the maneuvers. And basically this happens at the beginning of a turn. If a ship doesn't have a maneuver selected, the very first thing you do at the very first part is to select a maneuver at the beginning of that turn. Oftentimes maneuvers are going to carry over from one turn to another, but we'll see how that works as we go forward as well. But because this is the beginning of the game, neither ship has a maneuver selected. So before before we start working our way through impulses, the very thing, first thing we have to do is have each ship select an impulse. So how this works is there are basically two of these. First of all, to get kind of a step back moment, this is where we're going to select the maneuvers that the ships use. Now, if you're playing this two player, each player has one of these. There's one basically right north of this that faces the other side of the table. So the British player would use one control panel and the US player would be using another control panel. And then we're going to select maneuvers based on these blocks. And so basically what you'd be doing, you'd be hiding your maneuver from your important your opponent by selecting a block with the flag display and then just kind of putting it somewhere on the display here. And then when you complete the maneuver and get enough activations for it, you're going to show it to your opponent and say, yep, that's what I just did with these two activations that I got. So, um, but because we're doing this solo, we're basically going to kind of just use one mat and I'm just going to drop these little cubes here to mark which, which activation each individual player has selected. So that kind of explains the general concept behind the control panel. But let's talk a little bit about how the control panel here is set up. The control panel is divided up into sections depending upon the bearing of the wind. So for example, if we look down here in the bottom left, we see that this chunk of three maneuvers are only applicable if we have a bearing of C, which means running from the wind, running with the wind. So if we're running with the wind, we could pick back sail and one of these two things advance across the side and advance across a corner. So for us, what we're more concerned with now, because both ships are fair, have a B, uh, bearing with the wind, we're going to move to the B bearing of the control panel and talk about what's available to us there. Okay, so now I've changed the view so that we can see the section of the control panel that's relevant to the two ships current bearing because our two ships are currently in a B bearing. So they can pick, theoretically can pick from any one of these five maneuvers. But we already made mention before, however, you can only advance directly in the direction you're pointing. And because both the endymion and the president are pointing at a side, they would not be able to select this advance across a corner. So both ships have four options. They could either back sail, which means to stop as we've talked about before, or they could wear rotating to direction C, which is basically turning kind of with the wind to be in a running position, or they could to rotate the other way to port into the wind, which is rotating from, in this case, B to E, 
So it's easier to rotate one way than the other, as we'll see in a second. Or they could select advance across a side. Now, we already talked about which decisions that each ship is going to make. Basically, the British ship we talked about is going to make a wear selection. So normally, if I were playing two-player, I'd do something like this. So I can see what it is, but my opponent on the other side of the table doesn't know what I picked, and they've only seen this little formation here. But just for our sakes, because we're playing with one player, we're just going to drop the block here with the British flag up, letting us know that we've selected this one maneuver for this wear maneuver for the British, uh, for the Endymion, which is basically rotate one point to C. So this is what it's trying to do. Now, you'll notice this number here too, which is a one. This indicates, or a two or a two or a one, this indicates how many activations it takes to complete this maneuver. So a wear maneuver turning, kind of letting the rind push us to a running position is only going to cost us one activation. As we'll see, the Endymion, uh, the president, however, hasn't chosen so wisely because we talked about how we want to have the president rotate from B to E, which is this wear movement here. So the president's going to choose this other one. But we'll notice now that we have a slight problem. The problem that the president has is that it selected a maneuver here, a wear, that costs two activations. Yet we know that the president only has one activation available to it in this turn. And there's a special rule in the game that talks about straining, and it's a forced straining, which basically means that any time a ship selects a maneuver that it can't complete in the current turn, it also has to select one of these two straining options. Now, we're going to talk more in detail of this, but a very so we're not going to go into the weeds on it right now. We'll talk about it at the end of our turn. But basically, a straining option is either a forced move that requires the ship to advance to try to advance one square at the end of the turn or an optional move that the ship could take if it wants to but whenever you select a maneuver in in the course of a turn that you can't complete in the current turn by rule you have to pick one of these two options now the one and the two are different in the risk they involve and the bonus that the die roll modifier that you get we'll talk more about those at those as we get to the end of the turn for right now we're just going to say that the president is going to select the two-point straining maneuver and just kind of put that to the side. We'll talk more about the, what this means when we get to the end of the turn. So now that our ships have selected their maneuver at the beginning of the turn, now we can start working through activations. We know the British has selected the one-point wear maneuver that's going to turn it to run with the wind, and the president has selected the two-point wear maneuver that's going to move it from uh, a B direction to an E, where basically the wind is coming across the side of the ship. One last thing to just kind of make note in case I forget about it in future portions here is that like back sails where it says here may not be selected twice in a row even though it doesn't say it here wearing can only be you can't select wearing as well two times in a row so we'd have to select a different maneuver after this with that being said now let's go in and start working through our impulses and see how we can progress through a turn Okay, so let's jump in now and start working through our turn. And the way you work through turns, basically, is you start on the left-hand side. Both ships now have activations selected and uh, have maneuvers selected, and we know that we can go forward. Everything is set to kind of work through this 12 impulse first turn. Basically, what you do is you go from left to right, and if something happens, either a reload or an activation, we're going to deal with it in the course of what happens. So we're going to go one, two, three, four, five. Nothing happens, and now we get to number six, which means that the... Endymion has an activation. Now, one quick thing here too. Basically what happens with each one of these impulses is you're going to evaluate the maneuvers, then you're going to reload if that's applicable, and then the key thing to get with the rules here is that if either ship has an activation or a reload that happens in an impulse, both ships have the option to fire if they're able to do so. So, because the Endymion is activating, both ships now will have an option to fire at the end of this impulse. So let's go take this over to the control panel and see how this works with our maneuver. All right, so the Endymion here has picked up its little uh, activation and it's got this wear maneuver and it's got one activation counter and its maneuver takes one activation. So we know that the Endymion has completed this maneuver. Now, if you're playing two player, you would then reveal this to your opponent and say, yep, I just wore and I'm wearing to section C. But with the way we're doing it now, just playing for both players, we can kind of see that they selected this one and then it's activated. So that means that the Endymion has completed its activation and it can make this maneuver on the board. The president, meanwhile, has done nothing. It's, it's slow and it's just kind of plugging along in the water. It can't do anything. It's just going to sit and watch. Let's go back to the board and make this change now. 
All right, so very simply put, the endymion is going to turn to starboard. I said port earlier, that was an error. That's going to turn to starboard so that now it's, it's turned to sea. The wind is running over its sea bearing, and it's completed that maneuver. Now, we know by rule, right, that we talked about, that once a ship completes a maneuver, it has to select a new maneuver unless it's the very last 12th impulse, in which case is a special thing we'll talk about when we get there. So the Endymion has completed its maneuver. Now it has to select another maneuver. And we know what we want to do with it, right? Because the idea for the Endymion is to have it cut in somehow behind the president as it's turning now. It's going to turn up this way to cut in somehow to this side of the president to see if it can get some broadsides off at it. So what we want the Endymion to select is the maneuver where it's going to select across a corner. Now it's not facing a side, so we're going to select this advance across a corner maneuver. So let's go select that maneuver for the endymion and continue on. Okay, so now to get a sense of how this has changed a little bit, we're looking at the control panel with the options available for the endymion because now it's bearing to the wind as a sea bearing. It's running with the wind. The wind is pushing directly from the back, from the stern of the boat, from the ship. So we have these three options that we can pick from, and only these three options. We don't have to worry about any other part of the board. We could either back sail, or potentially advance across a side or advance across a corner. But we know that advance is only in the exact direction the ship is facing, so the Endymion cannot pick advance across a side. It has to pick either back sail or advance across a corner. And notice here one thing about this. With this advance across the corner move, it also includes a free wearing if the, if the ship would like to do it, because at the end it says, move forward across a corner to the adjacent square, may freely turn to A or B at the end. So we're gonna keep this in mind as we get after the kind of the back end of the turn, because we may wanna exercise this option to turn the endymion. So now the other question I have for you is what other thing, quiz time, what other thing does the endymion have to do given that it's got one activation left in its turn and it's just selected a maneuver that costs three activation points? If you answered strain, give yourself a bonus point in advance to the front of the class because that's exactly right. We talked about whenever a ship selects a maneuver that it can't complete in the current turn, it also has to select a straining maneuver, which is basically a forced move at the end of the turn. So we've moved up here to the straining maneuver section. We're basically just going to drop beside this one here, beside the US ship, a straining maneuver that's got two. Now these two and the one, it confused me at first, this doesn't indicate how many activations it takes to do this maneuver. I got really confused about that at the beginning. This only indicates the strength of the strain. So everything else on this control panel talks about how many activation counters it takes to make that maneuver. This does not. Straining is just the strength of the maneuver. It's got nothing to do with how many activations it takes. So we want to kind of dispel that confusion. That took me the longest time to sort that out because I thought everything on this control panel must be an activation, but it's not. This is just the strength of the straining maneuver. It's got nothing to do with how many activations it takes. So the Endymion has selected advance across a corner where it's going to take three activations and we'll continue into the next turn and it's going to select a two strength straining maneuver. Now let's go back and consider what our next activation, next things to happen are. So basically we've completed the movement and the maneuvering and the, the selection of a new maneuver for both ships now, because the president didn't get to do anything. It's just kind of sitting there. The Endymion has executed its maneuver, which only took one activation, and it's selected its next maneuver, because you immediately select a maneuver, unless it's the 12th impulse, you immediately select a maneuver after you complete one. The next thing that happens in this kind of activation, the, the, in the impulse, would you would if sequence of play, is that the ships reload. But all ships are reloaded, they're fully loaded right now, so that is done. Now we come to conducting fire combat. And that's where we're going to leave this one. And you'll notice that the Endymion has maneuvered itself into position where it can fire a broadside at the president. And the firing ranges for a ship facing a corner, basically it includes the ship and goes out in a straight line like this. So it just, just includes the president in its firing range and it would include a line that would go out this way. So this is basically, this arc here is its broadside range. Unfortunately for the president, which it's looking like the president's maneuver is a catastrophic, it could be potentially a catastrophically bad maneuver to go the way it's going. If you're facing a side, your broadside range comes out to the three squares to the side of it. Let me just zoom out a little bit. It's gonna come out to the three squares to the side and then it basically zigzags 
from that. So it's gonna be one, two, three, and then it zigzags at an angle off like that, which we can see doesn't at all include the endymion. So for firing options, the non-initiative player selects first, and then the initiative player decides if it's gonna fire. So the president can say, is the endymion, are you going to fire? The endymion is going to elect to fire because it's got a broadside on the president. The president, however, is not going to be able to answer with its uh, uh, port or stern cannons, but it will be able to get a little bit of a chance because it will be able to fire its stern chasers, right? Because the back of the ship is facing towards the endymion. So it can fire its stern chasers. And in response to the endymion firing its port broadside, the president is going to fire its stern chasers. And that's where we'll leave things right now in this dramatic moment where the endymion is fully loaded with round shot, ready to let fire at the president, the president's only gonna be able to get off its stern chasers. It's a slightly dicey situation for the president early on in this engager engagement. It looks like the maneuver to try to turn up into the wind is going to be a, 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 perhaps a very poor one that's gonna leave it exposed to at least one unanswered broadside from the endymion. So with that uh, pivotal cliffhanger of a moment, we're gonna end this first tutorial and rules overview. Thank you so much uh, for turning, tuning in. If you've enjoyed it, uh, please uh, give it a thumbs up as that helps get it in front of other viewers. If you're new, please consider subscribing uh, as about 40 to 50% of the content on the channel right now is historical gaming or wargaming related. Um, if you have questions or points or you noticed errors or anything that's a little bit off, uh, please feel free to leave them down in the comments below and we'll try to clarify them then. And as well, just to kind of reiterate, uh, for any errors or mistakes or little uh, omissions that I've put in here, there will be a known errors uh, clarification section in the video description. So be sure to take a look at that um, before you might ask a question as there may be the answer to that question already in there as well. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, if you enjoyed it again, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're new, please consider subscribing. We'll see you in our next episode where the Endymion fires at the president.